All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Sasquatch Out of the Shadows Live. I'm your host, Alex Petikov, as always. Hope everyone's having a nice week so far. We're back on a Tuesday again. We just got done filming Chasing Legends, our champ episode, uh, over the past few days. So it was a little tied up here as well. Um, but next week, we'll be back to the regular Monday schedule. But just a quick announcement. If you haven't seen previous shows, there's a playlist. You can check out previous guests. We have a lot of shows. We're up to 23 streams now. Last week, we had an awesome talk with Jeremiah Byron of the Bigfoot Society podcast. Really cool to talk to him. Next week, we're actually going to have on Nash Hoover, Eli Watson of Cryptid Campfire, and part of our Chasing Legends crew. So we'll actually be doing a recap of that expedition to Lake Champlain in search of the legendary lake monster champ, of course. And we'll be talking about, similarly to how we had a Mogion monster recap back in the summer, uh, just part of season one of Chasing Legends filming. So stay tuned for that. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe and share videos like this one. And, you know, if you know people that are interested in this kind of stuff, if you have any guest recommendations, anyone you'd like to like me to have on or try to get on, let me know. Send me a message, send me an email, whatever works. Petticopmedia.com. You guys know where to reach me. Comments below. Anything works. Tonight, I'm really excited to be joined by Pamela Pierce. So Pamela is actually the daughter of film director Charles B. Pierce, who directed the 1972 cult classic film, The Legend of Boggy Creek. A lot of people obviously know about this film. For a lot of folks, it's their first intro into the Bigfoot realm, and it's a very influential film. So I'm, I'm really excited as a filmmaker, especially to talk to Pamela about it. In, in the past few years, Pamela actually took it upon herself to remaster the film in 4K quality and re-release it on Blu-ray and as well as screening at festivals and big screens across America. And that's been a really cool endeavor on her part. And I know a lot of people are very excited about that and uh, have been, you know, people that grew up kind of watching that film. So very cool. So without further ado, let's bring in Pamela. Hey, how you doing? Very well. How are you? Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. It's an honor. Oh, thank you. It's such an honor for me to be here with you. I, I appreciate you asking me on. Yeah, I, I definitely wanted to have you on. Obviously, as I mentioned, The Legend of Boggy Creek is a very influential film. I think not only for people in the Bigfoot subject, of course, that can't be understated. A lot of folks, from what I hear, you know, some of the, especially older folks, they say, well, the first thing I ever saw was The Legend of Boggy Creek, or it'll be the Patterson-Gimlin film. It's one of the two which I think is really interesting. But beyond that, in terms of filmmaking, very influential film. So before we get into the actual film itself, how about a little background on yourself? What kind of got you involved in this subject? Obviously, you have your father and what got him interested in this subject in the first place? Well, so I grew up with it. I mean, my dad was in the third, I was in the third grade when my dad made the movie. I'm actually in the movie. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. <laughs> I play uh, Bessie Smith's daughter. And Bessie Smith is the one that yells, don't, oh, don't run, don't run. But at, the Falk Monster became a phenomena before my dad ever made the movie. It was uh, making the newspaper and people were, uh, having sightings and so it was the talk of the town it had been picked up by the national news so my dad actually was going to do a different film uh, an adventure like a wild uh, mountain man kind of adventure film and so they had gone to los angeles to do the pre-production and they were driving down sunset boulevard and they saw these teenage kids uh walking down the street with falc monster t-shirts on huh. so my dad made yeah, he says, Earl, oh, pull over. I got to talk to those. So he jumps out and uh, he said, by the time he was getting back into the car, he said to Earl, we're making the wrong movie. We have to go home. So they went back and they basically are just telling the story as it was told to them. Each of those encounters uh, in the film are directly related to an incident uh, an eyewitness account or a newspaper, a published newspaper report. So it was released as a documentary film and uh, docudramas, that term didn't exist. It actually, I'm told, is the first docudrama. Hmm. It's the full length, uh, first full length documentary. So on Bigfoot or this legend wow. surrounding Bigfoot. 
So, I mean, I've grown up with it. It's almost a part of my DNA. If, mm -hmm. uh, if you remember Candace Bergen, and she grew up with uh, Charlie McCarthy, kind of. Her father was uh, Edgar Bergen, I guess. So it's kind of a little bit like that. I I've grown up with the Falk monster, so he's always been there. Um, and then it would hurt me, kind of. I mean, it, it made me really sad. Over the years, I would not watch the bootleg, any of that kind of stuff. So I didn't see the film for a lot of years, but of course, People would talk to me about it, especially people uh, in the South when I would go home that, you know, knew it was my dad and everything. And so uh, I would read, though, on the Internet where people would ask, they, well, they would say, somebody needs to get the rights work, you know, worked out to this and then get us a good print. And so I read that over and over and over and over and over. And by that time, they were calling for a Blu-ray. And so um, I ended up contacting Mr. Ledwell and uh, asking him if he would let me do that. And he said yes. So it took me a couple of more years. It, actually, I asked him in late 2014, and I did not find a good source print until 2018. So it took quite a while. Wow. But we did it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just such a cool film. And I've talked about this on previous shows when I had Lyle on. Of course, we talked all about the Falk monster and the Jonesville monster, the history behind it, and, and how personally to me, the Fa visiting Falk, just it's a special place. And I'm sure you would probably agree with that. It's just so interesting. Yeah. And what I find so fascinating about The Legend of Boggy Creek is that it wasn't a film about the Pacific Northwest. It wasn't about Bigfoot in that area. And I think for a long time, there was this conception that Bigfoot was limited to the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot in Northern California or British Columbia, these sorts of places. We're talking about a Southern swamp monster, Bigfoot kind of thing. And I think that's really cool. I would argue that the Legend of Boggy Creek really put Bigfoot outside of the Pacific Northwest, sort of on a national map. And uh, I agree. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it was one of the first sort of docudramas that style didn't really exist. And uh, so many filmmakers to this day credit, you know, having seen that film influencing their style. I mean, I know the director of the Blair Witch Project had said this was a big influence. Some other filmmakers as well. It just has such a great connection to pop culture and, and the fact that it's a cult classic. It's amazing. I mean, and the way it was executed and uh, maybe just tell a little bit about the specifics about how long it took your dad to do the film. What was the budget like? How did they kind of put it together? Oh, that's a fun story. So my dad was, uh, he worked for the local NBC affiliate. He worked in the news department and he was the director of the news and he had his own television show after school. It was a kiddie show called the Laugh-A-Lot Club. And uh, he was Mayor Chuckles. So as actually he was already on television by the time I was born. So, and I was born in 62. So, I mean, he was on television for quite a while. And then um, he has it. He opens an ad agency, an advertising agency, and he's very talented. And so it starts to grow and he starts to he he starts doing these trucking commercials for this man, uh, Buddy Ledwell. And he would he would get the camera down low and the truck would be coming. And he, he was very influenced by mm. John Ford and, um, and just these old Western kind of movies. Oh, yeah. And so they started winning awards and then my dad's dream started getting bigger and he decided he wanted to make a movie. So he convinces this man, Mr. Ledwell, to put up the money. And at first, I think he pitched it as a small regional film, I'm told, with a budget of 30000 He ran out of money about three days in, I think. And he had spent the first money on film, of course. He used, uh, he went with Technoscope, which was a very kind of rare film format to use at that time. It had been big, uh, in the era before as it was developed for kind of these spaghetti Westerns, the Italian, and it was owned by Technicolor. So he used that film 
which cut down. They told me actually at, at the George Eastman Museum that it was brilliant of him to do it like that because it cut down tremendously on his cost. Right. So it was the main cost. So in the film, most of the people, they're either playing themselves or someone close to them, like Travis, Crabtree, the encounter happened with his brother, Lynn. So there's a lot of, you know, it, they're close. So my dad would get, he got the movie in like one or two takes. The one where we're all screaming, where the creature steps out and I'm screaming, that was done in one take. So my dad was very conservative with his film. And uh, he is out of money then by the time he goes to Los Angeles to the post-production house. He goes to Jaime Mendoza Nava, who was the composer, and Jaime had opened his own post-production house. He had been with Disney. So he sets him up with Tom Boutris, who's the editor. He sets him with uh, Ralph McQuarrie, who later does everything Star Wars. I was going to ask about that, yeah. Yeah, for, for George Lucas. So he introduces him to these, this top-notch talent who's gone independent of their own, and they give him another approximately... Sixty thousand dollars in credit. So Mr. Ledwell had invested about a hundred thousand, and then this other sixty thousand comes in. So he's got the film finished. He's got one print. He's got the Ralph McQuarrie. It's actually an oil and canvas painting. And he is so broke, he takes the Greyhound bus from Los Angeles back to Texarkana with his one print and his film poster. Wow. So, uh, and kind of the rest is history. They, they four walled what they call four walling. So they took, they rented uh, at that time. It was the Paramount theater. It was abandoned. It had uh, decayed. It was closed. My dad convinces them to open again. Uh, we actually went in all, he called all his friends and relatives, everybody to show up. And we literally cleaned the theater before the premiere. It wow. was, you know, it had, Coca-Cola and all that stuff, your feet would literally stick to the bottom of the, the floor. So we cleaned that all up. And then um, in the newspaper recently, because I've gone back and read, read lots of loose newspapers from then, uh, my dad says that he called all his friends and told them to send flowers. So the first night it was, uh, you know, I mean, no one ever, ever, ever imagined that it would turn into what it did but immediately the buzz started and it just grew and grew and grew and so he he there was a reject print he had a second print that he rejected in Los Angeles so he convinces them to send that one so they send it out and then he puts that at the strand in Shreveport and it repeats itself it there are people that are camping in the lines now they brought their lunch with them you know <laughs> tickets are selling out for all these prior shows so it really what they call it had legs as they said so amazing it just yeah it grew bigger and bigger and then uh, later on he can't get a distributor which is the classic, you know, that's the classic. And still that's, that's been my issue. Um, so they were hanging up on him, whatever later on, uh, he took great pleasure cause he went to work for Sam Arkoff at AIP, but Sam was one of those guys that had initially hung up on him. So literally he, uh, Mr. Joy Houck, who was a distributor and a Southern distributor, shows up at our door in Texarkana unannounced introduces himself to my dad. And um, anyway, so the rest was kind of history. They, they struck a deal later on uh, recently, you know, since I've come back and revisited everything, Steve Ledwell actually told me that at that initial, Mr. Ledwell made the deal with Hauk. It was for $2.6 million. And that was in, um, you know, 1972. I, I was told too that Mr. Hauk, uh, that the film was playing at some of his drive-ins. So my dad apparently was four walling from him and didn't know it. And it was the concession stand records that got the attention of Mr. Hauk in the beginning. Interesting. And the Legend of Buggy Creek held concession stand records. Uh, Mr. Ledwell had told me, he said, they may still hold today. 
you know, I don't know, it would be kind of fun to see, but for a long time, they had the concession stand record and we kind of guessed that it was because it, since it's a G rated film and there were lots of kids there that maybe they were screaming, jumping <laughs> up and spilling their drinks to the popcorn. But that's what initially got Mr. Houck's attention. And so he comes to my dad and my dad adored Mr. Houck. They were, they were great buddies and he distributed quite a few of my dad's films. That's it's what a story. And that's actually one of my questions I was going to ask was if your father or anybody had suspected kind of the what would happen afterwards. Do you think they had an inkling or was it just they just kind of thought they were making they a film? No now, my dad in his mind was always a star. OK, so it was it was only a matter of time kind of a thing. Um, right. So he probably expected it. I think my dad was such a character. And from the time he was a little boy, he was kind of a star. Uh, he was, I was going to say in high school, he was voted most talented, wittiest, and most likely to succeed. So oh, that's I mean, great. yeah. And he, to this day, when I, I went home as part of this and went back to his hometown, Hampton, Arkansas, where the famous uh, line, go ahead, make my day came from that area. And <laughs> so he, I went back and saw and met and, and revisited with a lot of the people that, you know, were his neighbors and oh, his cousins and all of that stuff. So it was great fun. And, and they told me that he was entertaining and, you know, he, he was entertaining back then. So he, he didn't expect it, but Mr. Gledwell, I'm sure it was a bonanza for them because it literally just about rained money during that time. And Filmmaker Magazine, not too long ago, adjusted the numbers for today. That would put the $25 million that it grossed in the three years, only three years has it ever been counted from 72 to 75. Those numbers were $25 million. And Filmmaker Magazine equates that to about 150 million today. Wow. So if you look at them, the numbers then, it makes The Legend of Buggy Creek the third highest grossing documentary of all time, which makes sense too. Yeah, that that's really, I, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. I mean, it makes sense adjusting for inflation and everything. But yeah, like I said, I mean, it can't be overstated how influential I think this film was in so many different regards. So, I think what we'll do is we'll look at some audience uh, questions and comments. So Stephen Jeffers says, scared the bejeebas out of me. I know a lot of people have that reaction to some of the scenes in the film. That's probably the most common, you know, that I was seven years old right. I was like in the film. It's interesting because the film almost has parallels today. You know, the film's in two parts almost. He's, he's there and then he goes away. You remember um, and the, the, when the songs come in and everything, and then he comes back. Remember, he's it, I think it's eight years at that point, And they said nobody really knew what happened to him or whatever, but he was back. And so the way that the creature is elusive and he's hard to find, it was similar to that and trying to track down, you know, original elements. And we were talking that I was talking to a friend the other day. The reason that there had that that the prints were so rare to back then one print of the legend of Wagon Creek consisted of five reels of film. So in 1975, when my dad and Mr. Ledwell part ways, the uh, Mr. Ledwell ordered all the film back to Texarkana. And I'm told that there were over 650 uh, copies of the film. And so they were literally swimming in reels. And so they burned everything all at once. So there was really no copies of the film. And so it was, that was kind of what was the, the hard thing. Everything that has existed, this is kind of an interesting uh, fun fact, but everything that has existed on the home market has been this, bootleg pan and scan, which I don't know if you know, consists of where you project the film onto a surface and then you take the camera and you pan and scan along with the action. Mm -hmm. So you're missing a great deal of the screen as you scan over to, you know, so you're, 
it's limited. So in our remaster, the technoscope wide angle format is back that goes across the screen and envelops you more. But I'm going to say it's a testament to the story that the film lived on the way that it has for these years between 75 and now in this home market with a subpar print. I mean, the print's bad that everyone has seen all of these years. You don't really get the full gist of the film until unless you'd seen it originally in its theatrical run or you're seeing it now. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's, a, there's almost like a grainy filter over it or uh, like an artifact. I mean, it's, <laughs> I, I totally get that, especially as a filmmaker. And that's what is so interesting about the remaster. I mean, even just the trailers you had put out, the quality, you know, that ambiance. I think one of the big things about Legend of Boggy Creek was the ambiance of the, you know, the swamp bottoms there and in the areas in, in Arkansas and that the frog sounds, all that stuff. It's like iconic imagery. And you lose that when it's, you know, some bootleg thing that's being sold at Blockbuster or wherever uh, over the years. And, you know, as I'm sure you know, there's so many different bootlegs out there and, and maybe right. it's a third or second generation copy. Right. So right. it's having even more on, distortion. Yeah. As time went on, it disintegrated down. Like, yeah, because they just, and no one knew that it was bootleg. So I mean, the people <laughs> buying the product, a lot of people say, well, I got it in the discount bin at Walmart. Yeah, because it was bootleg. I mean, <laughs> but that just says that it's a really great story. Yeah. Because when the film first came out, it was very critically acclaimed. I mean, people said it is a beautiful film. They said that it was artistic and that, you know, so and the cin cinematography was kind of the biggest thing that they talked about. They liked the musical score and and as you said, the ambiance. Uh, somebody, one of my favorite reviews says, "When atmosphere is everything, the atmosphere is back." And so those things were very important to kind of pull you in. Later on, as you said, it's an influence to the Blair Witch Project and the found footage film yeah. because it makes you feel like you're almost there. And one of the ways that it <laughs> did that was by using this technoscope wide angle format that it has that homemade feel to it, but it was yeah. that format that gave it the, the movie side to it. Like all of a sudden my dad used to say, he loved to use the word a major motion picture, you know, mm -hmm. like coming soon, a major motion picture. That was a big deal to him. And he wanted that look. So that all is back now. And we did, we, we spent just as much money on the sound restoration as we did on the film because those crickets and those frogs and that lonely cry are super important to the film absolutely. in addition to hey travis crabtree and lonely cry <laughs> absolutely definitely that's uh, sound is one of those things that you cannot underestimate for a film you can have a great film great visuals but if you have bad sound i right. mean it, it's not an all encapsulating experience Juanita Kersey says, I was 18 and I watched it at a drive-in back in the woods. Great movie. Yeah, lots of stories like that, folks who saw it back in the day. We have a cool question from Bigfoot Society. So this is Jeremiah Byron, who we had on the show last week. He says, question, what person have you met that you were most surprised that they were excited about Boggy Creek in general? Oh, wow. Um, I've met a lot of people that that were Boggy Creek fans. When I lived in Los Angeles, I was about 19 years old. And so I met a lot of people and they, everybody from, I mean, Hugh Hefner <laughs> was a fan. Um, just a lot of Hollywood was uh, very, they were fans. Again, that is another, I don't think that Hollywood it would have been, uh, would have been as accepting had the film not been such a critical and box office success. Right. They would have liked to have probably laughed off my dad as this Arkansas 
want to be like who do you think you are back then it truly was a studio system you know now you can get your iphone or you can you know it, it's cameras are much more accessible uh back then they were huge and uh and it was just it was so cost prohibitive so to do a film and then break through and have it break box office records. It was competing against The Godfather and Deliverance and Poseidon Adventure and Cabaret. Those were the top 10 movies that year. So, uh, you know, it had stiff competition. So it, it got a lot of people's attention. I was, I'm always shocked. I was watching, I saw uh, The Low Files, Rob Lowe with, uh, he did a, a Bigfoot episode. I don't That's know right. if you guys have seen his little thing, but at the beginning, they drive up to the top of this mountain and this native guide says, what led you on this adventure or whatever, on this journey? And he says, when I was seven or eight years old, I saw this movie called The Legend of Augie Creek and I have been hooked ever since. And that's what, you know, I hear a lot. So it's, uh, really cool. it's a really wonderful legacy because it's a positive thing, even though it's a scary subject, people have related to it always. So most of the feedback that I get is always of a positive nature. So, you know, it's a, it's a nice legacy to have. It's um, people really, they enjoy the film. People write to me almost every single day and they tell wow. me that it's their favorite movie or one of their favorite movies. So what that is so cool. my most shocking kind of story about Buggy Creek is I went to Horror Hound. My kids say, Mom, you have to say that correctly. <laughs> that really funny. But anyway, I went to Horror Hound at um, the convention last year. And I met uh, Bob Gimblin, which was just really uh, fun and just a spectacular experience. And then I met a lot of the fans, which has been so fun and my favorite story was this young man came to us and he said that when his father passed away his mom told him to go and get something that was important to him to include with his burial and he brought back the dvd bootleg and so wow. this man's father is buried with the legend of Wayne creek so that was pretty special i did i don't even think my dad is buried with bobby creek, you know? <laughs> So that is interesting. Yeah. It's, oh, I better be just so. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. It's just so interesting. And, and like I said earlier, I think so many people in this subject, the two things I hear the most often by far for people that haven't come to this subject, you know, I mean, when I say the subject, I mean, Bigfoot cryptozoology, people that haven't had sightings or experiences, they usually say, well, when I was younger, I saw the legend of Boggy Creek or the PGF film. So it's like one of those two things. And, I think that's really interesting that it's so influential to this day, even. I mean, you have a lot of younger people just starting to discover mm -hmm. the film. I mean, with stuff like online streaming and everything, right. it's a way for a younger crowd. I mean, I obviously didn't grow up during that time period, but I discovered the film having an interest in the subject. Right. So I think it's really interesting. And I hope film schools start teaching, you know, about if, the, if people are interested in the docudrama sort of genre, I think this should be included in course material. And it is, I think, sometimes. Uh, I believe that Temple Film School does teach a class or has taught a class because a few people have told me, but it's, I don't know exact ones, but it is, uh, both of those films are compelling, the Patterson and Boggy Creek. When you're looking at them and you're, and you're just looking at what's on film, it's a very compelling subject. So. Definitely. I think that's that adds so much to the mystery of it. And I said the way, like I, you know, the way that it was uh, technically filmed. My dad was, uh, our, he wore a lot of those hats too. I don't know if you know in that film, most of those. Uh, I think he he credits himself with Chuck Bryan or something. He gives himself different names, but he actually sings one of the songs. Do you know that? Lonely Cry. That's my dad. He said that he wanted Andy Williams. Oh, <laughs> but he, interesting. But he couldn't afford Andy Williams. And he would stay at this, I think he stayed at the Sheraton 
Burbank or something like that. Oh. And there was a lounge there, a bar, a famous, like a lot of really good singers. And I, I can't even dare to guess right now. Some, but people got started out there, discovered. And so there was somebody singing there. And my dad was convinced that that guy could sing the song. So he brings him to Jaime's and they have a full orchestra to, you know, perform the music. And so the guy gets up to sing and, my dad said that it's one thing to hear someone to sing in a lounge bar and then have them try to sing in front of an orchestra. It wasn't working out. So they gave him whatever. My, I think he promised him $250. Or so, so they pay him. And then uh, Jaime tells my dad, you need to, you just sing the song to hold the place. Mm -hmm. And um, so he did just so that it would be in there until they got someone else to sing it. And then they had run out of money. And so it was like, well, you, it's just going to stay. Jaime told my dad that he was better than the kid. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Wow. So Ian Robertson says, hey, Alex, love your show. I tune in every show. I love everything with the unknown. Hope you're both well. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate that. So I have one question that before I get to, I, there's some other audience questions, but my question is uh, pertaining to the poster artwork. So obviously the poster is, is well known far and wide, this iconic image of this sunrise and this Bigfoot like creature in front of it it was done by Ralph McQuarrie, who, as you mentioned, later went on to really do some of the Star Wars stuff and basically invented what Darth Vader and some of these supremely popular characters now. I mean, I was just watching the Mandalorian trailer today yeah. for their second season. So the connections here are crazy. How did the how did McQuarrie and your dad end up linking up? How did that come into being? Through Jaime and through that. Uh, now he Ralph was doing some work for NASA. I think that's the main work he had done before. Not a lot. So they're introduced. The first work that he does for film is for the Legend of Boggy Creek, and uh, a couple of people early on when I first started getting reinvolved, people would say, "Well." Chewbacca is not the influence. You know, there's no, anyway. Okay. So I kept, in, you know, dwelling into the subject and I read that George had originally, George Lucas had originally told Ralph, he envisioned Chewbacca as a, a combination of his dog and a lemur. And huh. so as I look at Chewbacca, a lot of times, sometimes I'll see a lemur in the neck. It's kind of thick and, you know, the way that he holds his head. And I, I see the companion side to George Lucas's dog. But more than anything else, I see Bigfoot right there. And so, Absolutely. you you know, just the image and what it what it turned out to be, you see the influence Later on, um, I'm told there are connections between The Town That Dreaded Sundown, another film that Ralph McQuarrie did the poster art for, and Darth Vader. It's Ralph McQuarrie who suggests that George Lucas used the scuba breathing apparatus to give Vader that kind of raspy voice. And in The Town That Dreaded Sundown, The Phantom Killer, he breathes, you know, hard in and out, and that mask goes in and out. And and as my dad would describe the film as he was making it and stuff, he would he would act that out and he would make the breathing and the mask, the way that it moved in and out, uh, that was a big part of that character. And so uh, there, there are said to be correlations there that are similar. And also between the baby Bigfoot in Boggy Creek 2 and some other creatures that are in there. John Scaleri knows a lot more about this. And his book Archives is a really good reference to, to McQuarrie's work. But it's now I mean, I'm going to tell you another little tidbit about that sure. poster painting. So the painting is done. It's an oil on canvas. My father was a an artist himself so i'm sure that probably had something to do why, with why they did it in oil but the bottom of it this is a lithograph that i have behind me but the bottom part of it is a cut and paste and that was done by 
the art director of the film, whose name was John Ball. John Ball was uh, later the art director for the Town That Traded Sundown and the Victors, the Norsemen, and a few others. And after he leaves my father, he moves to Kansas City and he goes to work for Hallmark Cards. And he is the creator and founder of Shoebox Greeting Cards, which is the largest, most profitable card company in all of history. Hmm. So his name is John Ball. So, so it's done by actually two really famous, you know, artists that a lot of people don't know their names. But as far as commercial illustrators, they represent literally billions of dollars. Ralph McQuarrie is greatly responsible for the look of Star Wars. And that is the highest grossing uh, franchise of all time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, just even today, they released the trailer for The Mandalorian, this new series. And a lot of folks in my age group are very excited for that kind of stuff, even the younger groups. So yeah. I mean, Darth Vader is probably one of the most famous movie villains of all time. So you have that right. connection. And the Chewbacca thing, it's its totally, you can see it. It looks like Chewbacca, I mean, running into the swamp there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, um, we, played, we played about two dozen shows across the country so far. We did re remaster in 4K also. Yeah. Which is, it's really fun to see it in 4K. Oh, I can but imagine. We played, uh, Alamo, we played a lot of Alamo Draft Houses. Those are great. I love those places. Yeah, it's so fun to play there. Yeah. So we played downtown Brooklyn, which I'm told is a super hip place. And we sold out, which is I'm told is even more super hip. And after that show, uh, I was upstairs and, and these young girls came up in their early 20s and they said, oh, I just want to tell you, we have a new favorite first, you know, a new favorite movie. And they also told me, you know, they they love the movie. And their next question was, are there still sightings? You know, they wanted to know all about the creature now. So it does show that it, it was able to transfer. A lot of movies are not able to transfer over time. But yeah. again, I think it's the subject matter. And that he did stay so close to the actual incidents. Right. So that, was yep. a fun, that was fun. And some people, let me just say this too. When people say, oh, well, the acting is not that great. Well, those, those are not actors. There are no actors in the film. So those are actually the people recreating the scenes. It, it is fun to talk to Lyle. Uh, you know, I know, but, and he may have told you this before, but like Mary Beth Cersei, the, in the scene where it's Mary Beth, Mary Beth, there's a draft on the baby. You know, that's actually Mary Beth in the bed. That's her mom, you know, that's that was actually terrorized that night. So when you have the acting, you have somebody that's just actually kind of recreating how they acted that day. Yeah, that's just so and it gives an authentic feel. And like you said, he didn't really stray too far from the original encounters and i think that's what's a hit about it and to this day i mean one take. <laughs> you better get it on one take amazing i mean that's that's you're dealing with people who aren't actors that's that's pretty remarkable it really and, uh, is. and and we're talking about falk again i mean just it's like it seems like in the last few years falk has really embraced this and you have the monster mart and all this kind of stuff and and you know talking to the folks over there they just say you know we have people from all across the country and the world even that come to this little town and I, I always comment on that. I mean, Falk is one of my favorite small towns I've been to, but had it not been for the film and the history, I don't know what I have ever ended up in a little place like Falk yeah. from coming from New Hampshire. I don't know how I would have ended up in a place like this, but a film brought me there and we had a blast. We hung out with Lyle. We stomped around the swamps and you could almost like feel that nostalgia from the movie. I think it's just amazing what, what, you know, what a film, what that medium can do. I think you can't reverse what the impact it had. I agree. It's a it's a very special place. I do think the movie probably put it on the map. We used to drive there. What well, you drive right through there from Texarkana to Shreveport. So my dad, before he had worked in Texarkana, had worked 
for that NBC. It's K T A L. It was, uh, and so they had a they had a station in Shreveport and then Texarkana. So we made that drive back and forth over and over. And uh, my dad would love to uh, pretend like we were running out of gas, <laughs> right? As we, because Highway seventy one, as you know, goes straight right. over the right over Boggy Creek. Denny from the Monster Mart told me that that is the one of the most stolen signs, if not the most stolen sign in the U.S. That Boggy wow. Creek. There, in fact, most of the time when I'm there, there's actually no sign. Only on the con, you know, on the side, it actually made into the bridge. Wow. Yeah, I, I when I was there, we didn't see the sign. We only saw the Falk sign. And right. You're right. They have a plaque that says Boggy Creek, and I don't think that would that wouldn't be very easy to steal. So yeah. maybe someone's tried, but the sign <laughs> yeah. would be a lot easier to steal. <laughs> so it's uh, the the cry the scream in the film also is good to note that that's actually a vocalization of the creature also i had asked i talked to travis crabtree about a year ago we were talking and um i asked him how my father had found him you know i had found his father Smokey, who right. you know acted as the guide and everything and so he said it was from the newspaper reports. And he said that Lynn had seen the creature, but Lynn didn't want to be in the movie. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Travis agreed to do it in his stead. And so uh, Travis said that the night that they were filming the dog scene, you know, with all the dogs, that the creature was ahead of them that night and they can hear it. So that's not the same vocalization that they recorded, but mm. that is, because I asked Travis, I said, did you, have you ever seen the creature? And he said, no, but we heard it. And he, and he told me when they had heard it. And then I remember when my father and Earl Smith, um, who was, you know, he wrote everything down. Travis told me on that same trip that he remembered Smokey taking them down to the different people that had had encounters and then Earl just writing everything down. Wow. So uh, later on, the reason I, I, I referenced Hampton too is my dad and Earl Smith write the original uh, story for Sudden Impact, uh, Go Ahead, Make My Day, which was a saying in that area that they grew up with. That was a threat that my grandfather used to issue to his <laughs> sons if they did not mow the yard, get the yard mowed by the time he got home, they were going to make his day. So uh, it's interesting that my dad did get to be kind of a um, known filmmaker, basically for just taking these things that were known around the town, you know, known around the area and using film and making them kind of worldwide. He also, you know, did that with Dreaded Sundown. Though he did embellish uh, on Dreaded Sundown, where Boggy Creek, there was he did not. He stayed very, very straight to the story. Right. Well, the scream is so interesting. I mean, even when I was there in 2019, Rick Roberts, who is Denny's brother, played to, played or sent me a clip of a alleged audio that was taken a few months before. Then it was like very scary. I'm sure you probably heard the I same heard one. That. Yeah. It's very similar, isn't it? It's yeah, and I was like, this yeah. is, I mean, yeah. a lot. Oh, this was so many years cool. ago, and now here we are. It gives me chill bumps. Oh, like, I've got chill bumps right now. Did he tell me that he was going to put that on um, some kind of speaker and, and have it playing when you come up? Oh, you know, yeah. Drive up to the Monster Mart. So I hope that, that he does that because it is very it's scary. It's very, it's yeah. Yeah. I've heard some weird stuff out in the woods, nothing quite like that loud, but if I was to hear something like that, I definitely would probably grip a pistol a little, a little <laughs> harder and you kind of hunker down. And that's another thing. My dad told me that those were the two things that he didn't believe could be faked, that you could not fake that cry because it has that, that frequency that 
like just kind of goes through you. Humans don't really have that power to, you know, it's like a lion when it roars. Yeah. When it really lets out that roar, it vibrates kind of through you, you know, and it's that same kind of a cry that's, you know, it's, it's more than just vocal. It's actually, it's moving, you know, megahertz, whatever it is. That yeah. A lot of people have talked about infrasound, all sorts of stuff. And that's something with right. a lot of Bigfoot witnesses that report the vocalizations, actually feeling it right, and that sort of stuff. So it's a lot of this stuff seems to be out of the audible range that humans would be able to produce, exactly. which is really interesting, of course. Right. It really but makes you wonder. Side the inside to it yeah and the other thing that he said that he didn't believe you could fake was the smell oh yeah so those two things and when he would hear those and there were a lot of the witnesses that he encountered that had had situations that didn't want their name used and they didn't want their story even used they just wanted to tell him look i, I had this encounter and i get yeah. a lot and i'm sure I know you do. And Lyle gets a lot of, uh, you know, people share their encounters. My uh, Facebook page that I run for Boggy Creek, the legend of Boggy Creek. A lot of people will leave their encounters in the comments. It's just amazing how um, it is. It's even grown in a way. I mean, it was yeah. popular back then, but as you were saying, a lot of these people that saw the film grew up, Rob Lowe, you know, grew up and stayed fascinated with it. And so it has grown the whole, now you can talk about it and people aren't as embarrassed to, to admit that they had, that they can't explain or, you know, whatever yeah. these encounters. So it's, it's a fascinating subject, I believe. Absolutely. And it's just the acceptance rate, it seems to be growing across the country. And uh, I was just up on Mount Washington here in New Hampshire recently and they started having in the gift shop they have little bigfoot stickers that say mount washington so i mean 10 years ago you would have only seen that out west or right. in maybe place like falc so there's a, it seems like a bigfoot embrace everywhere i mean just today i got two people telling me about their stories from southern new hampshire alone yeah. um so it's just incredible the amount of people that are kind of coming forward with these sorts of stories so i live just south of uh Pl uh, Cornish or Plainfield, New Hampshire. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been a couple of sightings up there near, there's a swampy kind of area. And if you go across, it's like six miles and there's nothing there. Yeah. And, and I'm reading these Bigfoot reports and I'm every time I, and I drive, that's where I go. I go up there to run my errands. I go to Lebanon or whatever. So I'm driving through there a lot and I, I always think that I'm just going to see it stand up somewhere, you know? Oh yeah. In, in these right environments, you know, another thing that's, it's kind of funny when I was home at, back in Texarkana Falk uh, last year for the premiere, I was running back and forth between the two places a lot. Anyway, my husband was driving and I, I was playing with my phone, doing, you know, I had it in my hand and I'm sitting in the passenger side and we're talking and everything I'm looking at. Anyway, a fox or a wolf or coyote. So anyway, something ran across the road right in front of us. And my husband was like, get a picture. Get a now I've got the camera in my hand. Okay. But by the time I was doing all this and it's gone. Pulled it up to take the picture, that animal was gone. So when people say, well, why don't we have good photos of it? Okay. I was right there with the camera and had it been the Falcon monster, I'd have totally missed it. So there are reasons why, you know, that there, that you may not see them. Oh yeah. I mean, just this past weekend, I was out in an area here where I have had some strange stuff happen. I've posted audio on this channel, wood knocks, that kind of stuff. There's been sightings near in the area. We had this awful smell that, hit us and it turns out it was a, a dead porcupine you just couldn't see it at night we found it in the morning but oh um, that would be so scary if oh, you it, smell it still. oh it was it was terrible but i mean that's the kind of thing that's reported with this sort of stuff yeah, and yeah. hearing knocks and that kind of stuff so it is interesting that it seems to be everywhere but um heading over to the questions here let's see bigfoot odyssey says y'all be sure to see alex on the bo Late show next Sunday. Yeah, so I'll be on Bigfoot Odyssey on Sunday night. That's Kerry Arnold. He's got a cool program as well, very similar to this. 
um, where it's kind of a live show sort of thing. My buddy Stefan asks, Pam, any thoughts on doing additional films continuing the legacy of the Boggy Creek monster? What are your thoughts about three or four other Boggy Creek movies which were inspired by your dad's work? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that we need to do, I don't think that we can ever do a remake. That's pretty much impossible, but definitely some sequels. And it would be really fun to go back and see if we could find out, you know, was uh, Herb Jones ever convinced, you know, was there, there's just a lot of angles I think that we could work on. The project I've taken on, kind of myself and it, it's been a large project just okay. for one person so yes I, but I, I would like to kind of team up with someone there I've actually talked to uh, one person that is very popular has made a blockbuster film before and he's told me anytime that that I want to do a remake he would love to write produce oh. direct any of those kind of things so uh, that and uh Jason Blum, I would love to do. I had read a thing that Jason Blum wouldn't be able to sleep until he got the rights to a remake. And he did a remake, uh, kind of a meta remake of The Legend of Boggy Creek. I mean, of uh, The Town That Dreaded Sundown in 2014. Yeah. So, so this person that I'm thinking and Jason Blum, if we teamed up, that would be a really fun, scary one. Uh, but yeah. there's others. Also, a uh, probably a bio on my dad, because as I said, he started out kind of uh, early on. He was entertaining and and was uh, his story and the story actually how Boggy Creek was made is better than anything he ever. I mean, I, Boggy Creek is a great movie and stuff. Uh, don't get me wrong, but the story of my dad too is a really uh, that could be very uh, easily conveyed on the screen, probably. Your story into itself, huh? Yeah. So uh, those would be fun. And then uh, what was the second part of the question? Is it, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can dig it back up. The question, the comments come so quickly. Yeah. Uh, here we go. What are your thoughts about three? Oh, the four? other movies. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um, you know, like I said, when the film was in the bootleg stage and a, a poor quality, I did not watch it very much. My other thing is because I grew up with a dad who loved to scare me and would test out new material on me a lot, you know, and these spooky stories and stuff. I don't watch very many movies. Um, I don't watch many movies at all, even not horror movies. I would go with my father uh, when he would, especially with the editing, I would go with him to the editing room at night while they were working on that. So things like editing and stuff, uh, you know, tech, I look at a movie as a kind of a, in a technical way and that messes me up a lot. And then um, I get so close to the subject and I'm, I'm kind of a, emotional person so i don't really watch those movies too much. <laughs> i have seen i've seen seth's um boggy creek monster which i really love it, he did a really great job on that um and boggy creek 2 the legend continues i actually worked on that film so that's okay. a whole story into itself uh that could there could be a whole movie made on that one but uh, and then I look forward to, I, I'm going to probably have a, a marathon one day and just get all of them and just sit down and watch all of them. So I'll tell you in the future, like, and maybe we can compare them. I hear that there's some good ones out there. I've never even seen the Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah. People are bringing that up in the comments. And obviously that's another one. I think later on, that was a movie in the eighties and I think the eighties or nineties, I, I grew up watching that one and some of the other ones where it was more kid movies, you know, as right. says like family entertainment type, type type stuff. But Glenn H says saw it on Cape Cod at the Orleans cinema. And he followed up with walked home through the woods after seeing it. Two deployments overseas later, still the most scared I've ever been in my life. <laughs> That's great. 
you know, people have told me too that growing up movies in Hollywood don't look like their neighborhood. Like they couldn't relate really. Right. But with the legend of Boggy Creek, they could go in their backyard and it could all of a sudden become those woods and they were Travis Crabtree or, <laughs> you know, so it was, I think it's a relatable film that people can kind of, and, and that would make sense for the, cryptozoologist of today right you know acting out the movie where they're they're looking for bigfoot or oh totally kevin hamilton says i hope this live stream is on tuesdays from now and until january i love it but i also love monday night football i hate missing one or the other i know it's tough sometimes it's just with scheduling i have to shift to tuesdays usually as a monday show as i've said um, Bomber says allegedly the actor who played Chewbacca was not allowed to leave the set in costume as it was too high a risk for him to be shot mistakenly as a Sasquatch. Yeah, I think that was in, in the Redwoods in Northern California, if not mistaken. Bigfoot country. I've heard that also. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's just it's it's funny. Like like I said, just how how much of an influence I think in so many different areas this film had. Obviously, in our Bigfoot subject, as we've talked about. But um, just in general, like with the, the Star Wars and just those tie-ins and docudrama, found footage. I mean, I've heard, as we mentioned earlier, people who have been influenced by it. I've heard Quentin Tarantino, not sure if that's yeah. true, has seen the film yeah. or has met and talked about it. So some really interesting characters. For a long time, Quentin Tarantino uh, said that he had the only known 35 millimeter print. Wow. But you know, it's hard to get in touch with Quentin Tarantino. You can't just call him up and say, hey, Quentin, yeah. can I borrow your print? I need to like restore the movie. So uh, anyway, that was, it. and the other thing today, it's different. Like at least my dad got the distributors on the phone. Today, you can't even get anybody on the phone. Wow. If I call Bloomhouse to try to, to, you just go into like, it's just recording, like press six. Yeah whatever so you don't even get and um so i when the when it came time to restore the film you know i thought well i'll go back i'll do it like my dad did a four while at the the it used to be the perot now it has also been restored the theater and now it's called the Perot was the paramount now it's the pro and uh named after ross perot who's also from texarkana which is kind of a fun tidbit, but so it was super fun to go back there and have the film all restored and then the theater restored and then having all of a lot of the actors and stuff that are still alive came to the event. So hopefully after COVID we'll go back yeah. and do this. It's something that we would like to, to establish as a yearly event. The 2019 event was actually nominated for best live event through the oh, cool. Rondo Hatton Awards. Yes. Yeah, so that and we came in first runner up. So that was great fun. That's awesome. So, and we're playing now. I'm I'm work again, I don't have a distributor. I'm kind of doing this myself. But we have two drive in showings this weekend. Uh, so if you go to our website our our, uh, our Facebook page, it'll show it'll give you the the showings, but we're playing in Ohio and in Pennsylvania this weekend. And I'm told it could be well that uh, this, the theater owner had actually, the driving owner had actually contacted me and said, contact my booker, work out the terms, whatever. So I did. And the booker said, well, if we do well this weekend, he tells me that he's the biggest booker of drive-ins in the world. So oh, that there you go. Creek will be coming. So if you guys are near uh, uh, Ohio or Pennsylvania, please go to the shows and let them know that you're there to see Legend Valley Creek. So Check it out. yeah, I have a link to your website down in the description below. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. So, um, or call your theaters, call your drive-ins and tell them to, uh, Call me on the Legend of Boggy Creek, www.legendofboggycreek.com. There is a page there where you can submit an inquiry to for us to play there. So I would love nothing more than to bring it back to the drive-ins. I think especially during this time where there's yeah. uncertainty and people are afraid to have it at the drive-in. There's a, a quote that I like that says, 
nostalgia is a powerful drug. Hmm. And I know that, you know, it is that that whole nostalgic pull. And there's something very co uh, comforting, I'm told, about Boggy Creek, even though it is scary. People also tell me that they listen to the music in the background. People tell me that they watch it every day. I mean, mm -hmm. So there's a comforting element to it, I think. Oh, so totally. To see it again in uh, 4K on the drive-in screen, you know, I think would be, it just would be super fun. Absolutely. And you get to just drive in, sit in the comfort of your car and yeah. relive what people used to do a lot more in the past, especially now with other regular movie theaters perhaps being closed. Uh, this is a good, good alternative. So, yeah, if you guys are interested, check it out. The website link is in the description below. And um, I think what we'll do is we'll take just a few more comments as we start wrapping up here. But um, Critter Hunter says, spread the word for this channel. He gets great guests. And even though I'm a skeptic, it's literally the only show I tune in for live. Hopeful but pessimistic optimism grounded in science is what I like. Yeah, thank you, Cryptid Hunter or Crit Critter Hunter. Um, yeah, we just try to have a good time here. And, uh, you know, people like Pam, I just always wanted to talk to them about, you know, what projects they've done. In her case, it's this cult classic film that she's restored, but always like to have a variety of guests on and different things going on. And then Bomber says, watch exists. It was done so well, clearly by someone who had an either their own encounter or really researched well before filming. So I think that was actually, that was uh, directed by the guy who did the Blair Witch Project. So he would have been directly influenced by the Legend of Poggy Creek as well. Yeah, that's Eduardo Sanchez and Mark Ardesky, which is fun. Mark Ardesky ended up winning the Academy Award for producing The Lord of the Rings with uh, Jackson, Peter Jackson. So Exist is definitely on my list. So I hear that that's one of the scarier ones. Yeah. So uh, I'll have to, I'll save that one for the last when I do my marathon. I, I've even that's thought right. about doing some live shows where we watch along yeah. know, the group and watch, especially like I, I, I've seen Boggy Creek now. I know that one kind of in and out. But. Right, right. That's awesome. Well, th we thank you so much for coming on the oh, program. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it the the opportunity to tell everybody that Boggy Creek is back. Of course, it is back and well, folks, and those people who grew up on it, people who are just finding out about it, younger folks, uh, perfect time, you know, get yourself a copy, check it out, see where you can screen it at some point, and, um, you know, just enjoy this awesome piece of pop culture history, not only Bigfoot history, but if you're into filmmaking in general, like I am, it's just something great. I think everyone can really enjoy it, so... Uh, we commend you on your efforts to restore it, obviously. And I think it's awesome that you've done that. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed being here with you guys. And um, thank you a lot. Yeah, a lot of audience enthusiasm. Last one, last one. Splash Boudreau says, I remember as a teen sneaking in a local drive-in with my friends to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And we see old bench seat and was hidden at the edge of the woods. Good time. So... Yeah, I mean, people that drive ins like they're classic. They're absolutely classic, and um, glad to see that Boggy Creek will be making a return in that regard. All right, well, thank you guys again for an awesome show. Thanks for all your comments and everything. Uh, we will see you next week. We'll be back on the Monday schedule, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show. We're going to be having on Nash Hoover, Eli Watson, and the Chasing Legends crew. We're going to be doing a recap of our Champ expedition to Lake Champlain, so that'll be a lot of fun. But until then, hope everyone has a nice week, and we will see you guys next week. Have a good night. Good night.